Twin girls, born ten minutes apart, stuck in a pact of silence with speech limited to their own secret language. These twins would experience traumatic events and countless attempts at therapy while under the belief neither could live a normal life if the other remained alive. By their late teens, they would find themselves admitted indefinitely to a high security mental hospital, housing murderers and serial killers such as the Yorkshire Ripper. This is the story of June and Jennifer Gibbons. Identical twins June and Jennifer Gibbons were born on the 11th of April, 1963. Their parents, Aubrey and Gloria Gibbons, immigrated from Barbados to Wales in 1960. The twins started to speak at a late age and shared a speech impediment, making it difficult for people to understand what they were saying. June and Jennifer would go on to speak with one another in a language only they could understand and mirror each other's actions. These behaviours would be described as a part of a phenomenon that occurs with twins known as cryptophagia. Getting through school would prove difficult for any shy child with a speech impediment, but what made it worse was the twins were the only coloured children in their community. The colour of their skin, coupled with their different behaviour, would result in children ostracising and bullying the twins so severely the school administration would allow them to leave early each day. As time went on, the twins became more reserved and would eventually refuse to speak to anyone but each other and their younger sister Rose. Though the girls continued to attend school, they would refuse to read or write. June would later speak on these behaviours as an adult, saying, We can eat food, drink, or do anything like that, that's normal. Normal if we think that people do, they were granted, we couldn't do it. We were sensitive. When the girls were receiving their vaccinations for tuberculosis, John Reese, a school medical officer, would notice their impassive behaviour. The twins would refuse to speak with John, despite his attempts, which would cause him to voice concern to a child psychologist. This would result in the children seeing a slew of therapists who unsuccessfully attempted to get the girls to speak with others. By their 14th birthday, they would find themselves moved from their school to the Eastgate Centre for Special Education. At Eastgate, they were analysed. Sessions would be watched from a one-way mirror and recorded through hidden microphones. Soon, therapists would begin to notice the twins would only speak once they were alone. The secret language they spoke in was found to be a fast-spoken mix of English and Barbadian Creole. Psychologists would begin to discuss the idea of separating the twins to bring them out of their catatonic states. It would seem the girls were aware of their situation and wanted to break out of their self-imposed silent behaviour. June would write a letter to a therapist. In it, she says, It would be a good idea if we separate. I think one should go and one should stay here. We act stupid when we're together. Some people think that we don't want to separate, but we want to, because it really is the best thing for us. Jennifer too would agree in her own letter, stating, It would be good to separate. We both fight for the best things, we're both willing to lead our own lives, but when we're together we just keep depending on each other too much. In separating the twins, it was decided one would stay and the other would leave. Psychologist Tim Thomas would leave this decision up to the girls. The otherwise silent twins erupted into shouting matches as they argued amongst themselves, stunning medical staff. Tim gained insight into their dynamic, noting he heard Jennifer scream, You are Jennifer, you are Jennifer, at June during one of their arguments. The girls would eventually be sent to separate boarding schools in the hope it would break them out of their silence. Unfortunately, it proved useless, and after being separated, the pair entered catatonic states, refusing to speak, dress, or go to the toilet and often crying for hours. The separation would come to an end as psychologists exhausted methods to try bring the girl out of such states. 
It was a dire situation. Tim Thomas expressed concern if they were unable to help them as children, an adult psychiatrist would diagnose the twins as schizophrenic and have them incarcerated. As an adult, June Gibbons would recount this time. We wondered where we'd end up. We wondered what happened to us if we couldn't speak. When we were 16, we were in our bedroom and we weren't mixing like other teenagers, going out, night cabin, and going to discos. So we wondered where we would end up. At 16, the girls would drop out of school and sit in their room, spying on the outside world through binoculars, creating elaborate plays with their dolls and writing. Both twins were avid writers, creating plays and stories, as well as writing to pen pals all over the world. Attempting to learn how to communicate with their family, the twins would pull together their unemployment benefits and purchase The Art of Conversation, a course on communication. Though the girls tried their best, the course would not help them to speak. Defeated but still wanting to contribute and make their family proud, June and Jennifer would turn their sights to their passion of writing in the hopes of becoming novelists. June would write a novel titled Pepsi Cola Addict. The book itself is notoriously hard to find, but one reviewer had this to say about the book. Preston Wildley King, 14, lives in Malibu with his widowed mother and sister. He is literally addicted to Pepsi, to the point that all his thoughts and fantasies are focused on it. When he's not drinking it, he's dreaming about it, even creating art and poetry based on it. It amounts to his religion. He is deeply in love with Peggy, but she dumps him after an argument over his Pepsi habit. His friend Ryan is bisexual and desires him. His math tutor seduces him, and when he sent to juvie after robbing a convenience store. Mesmerised by a crate of Pepsi, of course, he sits down and drinks some instead of running. He's molested by a guard. Preston's choices and misfortunes are chronicled with that distinctive Gibbons flair, full of elegant metaphors, quirky slang, and over and under currents of emotion that take on a life of their own. Jennifer would write The Pudgelist, a novel about a desperate physician who kills the family dog so he can use its heart to save his child. After the transplant, the dog's spirit would live on in the child and exact revenge on the father for killing it. She would also release Discomania, a story about a young woman who discovers a local disco that incites its attendees to incredible violence. Unfortunately, I was unable to find any reviews for these books, but what I did find were a few lines from Discomania, from the documentary Silent Twins. They read as following. There were teenagers all around, jumping on top of each other, pulling anybody to the floor with salacious frenzy. They screamed loudly to the music, pulling out blades and stabbing their best friends to death. These books would never be picked up by publishers, and at the age of 18, the girls would decide to venture out of their self-imposed prison. Two American boys had caught the attention of the twins at Eastgate. The boys were known to have committed arson and theft. Despite this, the twins fell in love with them, dressing up in clothes and makeup and visiting them every day. The girls believed this love was reciprocated and were introduced to a world of sex, drugs, and alcohol. As an adult, June would recount this time by saying, I felt like a release. Okay, we speak now. I'm be ourselves. Lose our inhibitions and be ourselves. And come out and speak properly. And laugh and talk like normal teenagers. Psychologist Tim Thomas, who had also worked with the boys, described them as very destructive and damaged individuals. Expressing fear the boys would have bullied and taken advantage of the twins. Though the girls' newfound love had them leaving the house and speaking, it caused the girls' already complicated relationship to strain further as they fought for the boys' attention. Jennifer would write in her diary, I'm not ashamed to say I tried to kill my sister. Things got out of hand. I did not succeed in strangling her with the wire to the radio. I'm sure she wanted to kill me too. 
I have a grave feeling she did. June would also recount a time she had tried to kill Jennifer. I'm fighting, I'm arguing, get away with I pushed her in the roof and I pushed her a hundred times. I said, right, go on, die, go on, die. As the summer came to an end, June and Jennifer learned the boys were returning to America, and after their departure, the heartbroken twins would return to their room of solitude. Though this would not last, and by 1981, they would begin to commit acts of vandalism, petty theft and arson. On one night, June and Jennifer would go as far as to burn down a tractor store. Police would track them down and get a hold of their diaries, in which both girls had written about committing the act of arson. Soon after, they would find themselves in Puckle Church Remand Centre. While at Puckle Church, the twins reverted back to silence, but would scream and fight with each other when paired in the same cell. Once separated, they would enter such a state that the staff would reunite them. Once reunited, the cycle of fighting would continue, baffling Puckle Church staff. Psychiatrists would find the only way to communicate with the twins was to use an internal telephone. Jennifer would tell them she heard voices, had visions, and wanted to kill June. June would also allude to killing Jennifer, and describe herself as sensitive, able to pick up on people's moods, and speak about having premonitions. During these conversations, it was revealed that they had not properly spoken to their parents since their early teenage years. The adult psychiatrists would label the girls as schizophrenic and diagnose them with their psychopathic personality disorder. After spending seven months in Puckle Church Remand Center, the twins would undergo trial. The trial was over quickly with the defense only bothering to call one witness. What Tim had feared when the girls were children came true. The result of their trial was an indefinite sentence to Broadmoor Hospital, a high security mental health hospital. At only 19 years old, the twins would be the youngest ever inmates admitted and share the hospital with murderers and serial killers such as the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe. Unaware of the grim reality of their situation at the time, June would say, we thought Broadmoor was going to be like paradise. The twins found wards loud and crowded and continued their refusal to speak for two more years. As part of their treatment, June and Jennifer were routinely tranquilized and given antipsychotic medication. They would, however, overcome their shyness and begin to speak freely. Though despite their progress, year after year, the twins would be denied release. During this time, Jennifer would write to June, claiming she knew she would die at an early age. In March of 1993, a month before the girls turned 30, they were finally granted transfer to Caswell, a medium security facility. The transfer was the first step toward being granted freedom and a chance to live their lives. A day before their transfer, Jennifer began to feel ill and her speech became slurred. Jennifer would tell June she was dying and on the trip to Caswell, slept in June's lap with her eyes open. When the girls arrived at Caswell, Jennifer could not be woken and passed away soon after. The cause was acute myocarditis, a sudden inflammation of the heart muscle which is rarely fatal. The autopsy revealed no signs of drugs or poison in her system. Jennifer's death was unexplainable beyond the diagnosis. A few days after Jennifer's death, Marjorie Wallace, author of The Silent Twins, would visit June and claim she told her, I'm free at last, liberated, and at last, Jennifer has given up her life for me. Jennifer would undergo intense grief over the next coming year, but also found herself free of the binding, complicated, and destructive relationship she shared with her sister. After 12 long years of imprisonment, June would finally be released from Caswell Clinic. As of 2008, it's reported June is living independently from her parents in West Wales and is no longer monitored by any psychiatric services. 
When researching this video, I found some sources and videos trying to mystify this case and make the twins sound off the wall creepy with secret languages and death packs. What I feel I found were two troubled twins with destructive connections and mental health issues struggling to fit in with society. You do get a sense the child psychologists really tried their best and while I don't know all the details pertaining to their lives, the case, and whether or not a high level security prison was justified, it's not hard to see why they committed their crimes. June and Jennifer stood out in an unaccepting society that mocked and bullied them. They found what they believed to be love in other mentally ill boys who brought them out of their shell only to leave after a short time. Their way of lashing out at society wasn't right, and it could have resulted in a loss of life, but the punishment cost the twins over 13 years, and it could be argued it cost them Jennifer's life too.